Here we go. The Vermont 100 rates report. It was a big one and there's a ton to unpack here. So hang tight. Leading into the race, I had a two week taper block where I just relaxed a bit, downed my mileage, did a couple mountain runs and some camping and then some low mileage. And, and it really wasn't until like a day or two before the race that my legs actually started feeling good. And that's normal before you know, when you start tapering because it, all these little aches and pains that get masked by your everyday mileage start to show up. And so my confidence was, you know, all over the place, but you know, come Friday, I felt pretty good and started to figure out my game plan. Like this race is fairly predictable time-wise, provided that you have a dry course and some decent weather, which we did. Temps weren't, temps were in the low 80s at the probably late morning, but we had some good breezes and the course was dry and fast, just a few wet spots. I set this goal of maybe somewhere in between the 16 and 18 hour range for my first 20 mile. 21 mile checkpoint. And what that would let me do is, you know, take my pace of, of nine minute miles and then back off as I needed to. And I thought that was a fair approach. But the one thing I didn't have in this race is the experience of the scale, you know, the, what is 18 hours of racing or what is 16 hours of racing? Up to this point, I'd raced up to eight hours, which is half that. And it's, it's really one of those things that you just have to do as much as someone could have told me in the beginning, like walk every hill, do this, do that. I don't think I would have listened regardless. So um, I'm excited to have this experience and build off of it, but it was really challenging um, to learn it the hard way or, or just to get go through it and have your expectations be flexible and adapt along the way. So that night, got a couple hours of sleep. You know, I had friends staying nearby, so I had my own place to stay, own room but still restless, you know, a lot of anxiety going into this race with all the uncertainties. So, so the Thursday night didn't sleep very well. Friday night didn't sleep very well. I got up around 2.45 and, you know, did all the, went through all the motions, got to the start of the race, got ready, and next thing you know, we're on the starting. How are you feeling? Like I just slept a couple hours. Nice. But, ready to go. A little flare here. Oh, yeah, I got my headlamp, la headlamp flare. Last minute anti chafe everywhere. Again, looking good here. Uh, wearing his hokas. What are you wearing on your feet? We're going to challengers. Chafe right, stick? Ready to go. It's like 3 30 in the morning, half an hour to start. Dialed in. Feeling good. Feeling okay. Don't put words in my mouth. Just got your pile of stuff. All right, well, I need water. I think that's like it. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Andrew. found myself in this first stretch which is the 21 and a half miles before we see our crew and I was kind of in the lead and then as soon as it started going uphill because it starts with the downhill but as soon as it starts going uphill uh, all these guys took off and I was like wow they're going kind of fast like I was really jogging and looking at my watch I'm like all right I'm going 10 minute pace but man these guys gapped me pretty pretty quickly so I was trying not to be concerned about that because 
these first 20 miles, 40 miles, 60 miles don't really matter. The, the whole point is to save your legs for the end. And so I just kind of let them go. I found myself at one point hanging out with um, Mike Hames, I think that's his name. He ended up placing fourth. But um, I ran with him a little bit, but he was charging on the downhills. And I was like, I can't hang, but I'd catch him a little bit on the uphills. And so we yo-yoed a little bit. Um, but it was also evident at this point that having people behind me, it still felt like a race and it shouldn't have like those, those first, um, 20, 40, 50 miles shouldn't feel like a race. You should be cruising. It should feel like a training run. And that's just something you need to learn with experience. But overall, you know, that first 21 and a half miles, I did have some warning flags, like some things started to get tight and sore and, you know, 21 miles in, you shouldn't, shouldn't be experiencing that. Now the question was like, where was I going to get to the in the course before my legs gave out? I just knew at some point it was going to happen, and my biggest training run was 35 miles into this race, and so I, or like six hours. So I thought for sure I could make it that far and be like completely fine. Because this is a really pretty house. No, you did cereal and you just. Yeah, yeah. 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 Good. Good. Yeah, I'm trying to be responsible. Good. Yeah. These guys are like. I think they're racing up. Yeah, but it's crazy how hard these guys are going out. No, this is this is this is me and Command Post already brought us. I know. Yesterday, somebody. Thanks. Five. All right. So from mile 21 and a half to the next eight crude aid station, which was 30.3 at Stage Road, this is where the quads started to really feel it. Some big climbs and more technical terrain. We're, we're getting off the dirt roads onto trails, grassy fields with some steep climbs and steep descents. And at this point, I started to really notice my, my right quad and it was starting to go a little bit. And that's, you know, you don't want that happening anytime that early in the race. At that point, I should have backed it off, and I didn't, this is where I'm learning strategy on the fly about how to mitigate um, all the pounding and all the climbing. So running down into Stage Road, my legs were taking a beating. You know, it's starting to get hot out. You know, surprisingly hot for I don't know eight o'clock in the morning, something like that. So I got into that next crew station and you know threw on an ice bandana, which was earlier than I thought I'd need it, and. Um, at this point, I was putting ice into my arm sleeves, just trying to deal with the heat management. And I was, for my nutrition, just for like the whole race, I was drinking like 100 calories per water bottle um, with electrolytes and I was eating goos and shot blocks. And the only thing at the aid stations that like even appealed to me were really just fruit like uh, watermelon or cantaloupe. And that's pretty much all I ate for like the entire day. Um, more on that later. So anyway, so like I guess till mile thirty, at mile thirty, like I was chasing splits and I was like, all right, I can still do this. We'll we'll, we'll keep going, but from this next section, from mile thirty to forty seven, and mile forty seven feels like the halfway point, Camp Ten Bear. It's an aid station you go through twice. It's one where I had was planning on taking some extra time. This was like the rough patch, and I think this is probably the I for me was the crux of the day because this is where I went from just competing to, okay, let's, let's ref let's shift our focus here and, and figure out what we need to do to, to finish and not only finish, but when I pick up my pacers, make sure that they have a good time and I'm still running. Really what happened was like my quads started to blow out and then they started to cramp up with these cramps and, and, you know, it really freaked me out because I'm what, I'm only 30 something miles in. Man, I was at mile 33 at this aid station and I, I passed this guy and I was like, how you doing? And he's like, great. And then I just heard him vomit. I turned around, he's in the middle of the road, just throwing up. And I was like, whoa, I mean, we're 33 miles into this race and this guy's probably, I don't know if he's going to rally or not, but you know, the damage was done. And I was feeling a little bit the same way because I'm like, wow, my legs are really tired for this early in the race. And that just goes back to the vertical, you know, for this race is 15 to 17,000 vertical of just rolling up and down. You know, there's a few flat sections, but not many. So I've always had quad cramps and they showed up right on cue, like mile 35. And this always happens to me in the Vermont 50 race. Although last year I didn't get them 
and I'll get to that later, but it's like deja vu. And the only thing I, I could think of to just calm them down was to stop, massage them, sit, just reel it in. And a pack of guys passed me and what they were doing was walking every hill and then shuffling on the, on the flats and kind of just letting gravity take them on the, on the downhills. So the gravity miles on the downhills. And that's the strategy that I adopted, but it was almost a little too late because clearly, you know, for my fitness, I was going a little faster and or harder effort than I probably should have. Again, something you don't know until you get out there and try it. So I followed these guys and I just, I just tried to like keep them in sight. And, you know, I got, every time I got to a hill, it was nice. Like I could walk, but I was also a little disappointed because I really, I wanted to put in this, this hard effort and I didn't feel like I was putting in a hard effort by walking. Little, I, little did I know that pretty much every hundred mile race, like you walk a ton of it. And well, that's one of the take home messages is, you know, whether you're walking at the beginning or the end, you're going to be walking, um, unless you're one of those top, top elite guys. So that was like the momentum killer. I think some point between mile 40 and 43, I actually sat on the side of the trail. I watched the woman leaders fly by me and a bunch of other guys. And at this point, the hundred Kers are in the mix. So now it's all just, it's, you know, I was at a point where I was alone, but now I've got people, but I don't really want to talk to anyone because I'm dealing with my own demons, trying to figure out how to fix my legs and really unsure. I'm like, well, I've got 60 miles left at least, you know, so how am I going to figure this out? And I popped down at two, yeah, 40. So I'm at Camp 10 Bear, mile 47, see John Spinney, and he hooks me up with some calcium magnesium, like Tums tablet, and I take that. But I also take like ibuprofen, I take Tylenol, I take like a salt stick, shotgun method, anything that might get my quads under control. And I took at least 11 or 12 minutes at the aid station, just switching shoes, relaxing. You know, at this point, I'm not worried about my time. I'm not worried about my place. I just want to hang with my crew and enjoy the rest of the time here and make sure that um, I can still move and finish this race. Yeah. Hang in there. Should have brought a table. Yeah. 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 So they got me, they got me going again and I shuffled out of there, got a bathroom break and eventually like the, the cramps stopped, but the damage was done. Like my quads were already shot. And so I just like kept up with this shuffle, like uh, walk the ups or I do 30 seconds on 30 seconds off if it was just like a little up and, um, and running was just really difficult at that, that point. Like. Um, I enjoyed the walking because it just felt so much easier. Getting to the next aid station was mile 58, Margaritaville. And that's, I think like my legs came around and, you know, at that point I was in a much better place mentally and I just tried to just keep moving, but I wasn't racing. Like I wasn't, I still wanted to really enjoy every aid station and the people I saw along the way. Here you go. We've got some other fans. Hey, go Andrew! From Silver Lake, New Hampshire. Nice. <laughs> Good. Got it. No, guys, and how far? Eleven, 11 miles. Who knows? All right. <laughs> Who knows? We keep finding places. There you go. Yeah. Right. He looks much better than he did last time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. You would have seen him about three miles after we saw him. Yeah. 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 I know. That well, that was after that road walk too. On the I think from Margaritaville back to Camp Ten Bear, like 
I don't know. The only thing I really remember is that there was like a felt like three mile stretch of downhill and I ran the whole thing and I was really psyched. You know, I'm back under, I'm running like sub 10 minute miles there for the first time in a long time. But it was still, it was just like, if you can ignore the burning in your legs, then, you know, you can keep moving. Back at Camp 10 Bear for the second time, feeling much better, pick up uh, Hillary to pace me the first leg, which was just under seven miles to um, the next aid, the next crude aid station. And it was great, you know, having her, someone to talk to, and she shot some footage. It was very beautiful. It was really cool. Um, that was probably like my, my favorite stretch of that afternoon. I was in a pretty good place mentally. Running to the barn, it's a beautiful barn. I was wondering what your games were. Like, I spy. Oh, hi guys. This is so beautiful here. Andrew's cruising, he likes the downs. I'm going down. Having fun? Yeah! Have you done this before? Yeah, twice. Okay, so you know what you got yourself into. Sort of, although it's always kind of... Different each time? You never know, right? Yeah. Have fun. Go get your shot. Do you want me out of your shot? Single track for days. Let me get you. Go ahead. Some pretty well, like I mean, it's not shouldn't get shouldn't hype too hard. Little side hill, side hill shuffle. We're cruising. A station, A station. Back up to these guys. Oh, those dogs! How are you today? I'm good. I just started, so. <laughs> There's uh, avocado wraps, Ooh. chicken quesadilla, uh, cheese quesadilla. Sorry. Andrew, do you want an avocado wrap? No. Thank you. All I want is watermelon. You got it. We got that. Sure to film him. He's famous. You yes. famous? That's Richard Busey. Hi, Richard. <laughs> Look, thanks for coming out and helping. <laughs> One, six, two. One, six, two. I just saved some guy from going the wrong way, but I got to see these cool like stone hedge. That's so cool. Anyway, it's so beautiful. Gotta go find Andrew. But it was also a point where I went off course. We saw someone going the wrong direction. She went off one way. A guy and myself went on the course. And as we were coming over this hill, I saw the signs and they looked like they're pointing to the right. And so I went to the right. And of course, I didn't see any markers when I got to like another junction about a quarter mile down. And I asked the guy if he saw any markers, he said no. So we turned around and they weren't, these plates weren't pointing to the right. They were pointing more like forward to the right, to the, the like I was supposed to go straight. So it was kind of a weird junction of something that I just looked at from far away. And in my head, you know, being that late in the race, I was like, that's the way you go. And obviously that wasn't the way you go. So I, I gave up like seven minutes there, repassed, you know, I had to fight back to get where I was in the race. Hillary, meanwhile, is at the next aid station being like, where's my runner? And um, so I feel felt bad for her, but you know, that's part of it. You know, I think like if she was with me and I was in front of her, she probably still would have followed me. And 
yeah, you live and learn. So at mile 76, switched off with Jeremy, my other pacer. This next stretch was 12 miles. The tough one, it was around sunset. So there were periods where I did, definitely felt a little tired. I was able to go to the bathroom again, which is a good sign. I just kept drinking and eating. And, but at this point, like my feet, the, the heels of my feet were getting bruised. Like the dirt road's really firm. I'm starting to feel the wear and tear of the day for sure. We have to play this at two times this week. Oh yeah, we'll mute the audio. I also didn't have a headlamp. Forgot to grab a headlamp at the other aid station. And so it was sort of a little bit of motivation to get to, get to uh, the next crude aid station, which was mile 88. How's it going? Got a nice uh, sunset backdrop. Couple of sheep back there, cranking up to bills. And we got to 88 before sunset. This point felt like a convergence of a ton of 100 Kers um, horses and other other racers and Billis was a really cool aid station has beautiful view of a Scutney and um, the valley below so from Bills to Polly's and Polly's is the 603 aid station that was another short stint with Hillary it was pretty fun as well that was our first night section and they pretty much remarked the course with glow sticks which is great for navigation but running at night is is slow just by the nature of it and we cruised, you know, we got in a good rhythm, lots of walking again on any hills. But I thought that ultimately we were making good progress. Okay. Traveling. How many steps do you think you've done today? What did you and Jeremy talk about? Oh, you know, we talked about it. Huh? Yeah, we talked about some stuff. Chat, 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 chat. And once we got within, you know, three quarters of a mile of, of Polly's, you know, we were able to run pretty much that whole stretch in. And, and when I got into Polly's, sat down, chilled, reevaluated my time, you know, goals. And initially it went from like 16 to 18 hours and 18 to maybe like sub 20. And then I think at mile 80, I thought, oh, trying to do some math. I was like, well, maybe sub 21 at this point, just salvage the finish. When I got to Polly's, all I had to do was 15 minute miles. So at that point I was like, all right, let's, I made a pact with Jeremy. I'm like earlier on, I was like, let's not kill my legs just for the sake of a time. You know, I'd much rather have my legs come back quicker than say I ran like an hour quicker. Easier said than done. We start running and I'm like, we banked an 11 minute mile, then like another 11 minute mile. And next thing you know, we're like, th we're three miles from the finish. We're still walking a little bit, but pushing and passing some people along the way. And, you know, next thing you know, Jeremy's, Jeremy's chirping, oh, we should do, you can get 1930. And so from there, we, we pushed for 1930 and like got it by close to, uh, got it barely. Um, but it was really cool. That last section, last mile, last mile and a half, I, I came across a guy that, is doing the Grand Slam, and I hadn't seen him since like mile 33 or somewhere around there. Um, and that's just, you know, you go a whole day, you see someone, at, you know, near the start, and then you catch him on the finish. It's pretty wild. Quarter mile to the finish, you start seeing glow sticks and jugs if it's that late in the day. Jeremy, Jeremy and I hammered, made it to the finish. It was pretty surreal. Like, there's Hillary standing there, Amy Rusecki's greeting everyone, and I'm done. <laughs> like, really, all I wanted though, I just kind of, I was like, where's the cots? Where can I just lay down and recover? Because it was such a long day and such a big effort that all I wanted to do is just lay down and chill. Where are you going? Yeah, Andrew! All right. Woo yeah, yeah, Andrew! Crushing! Nice work. What's your number? You did it! One, two, Under 1930. Yeah. Hell yeah. You can stay closer to 19. Nice job, Jeremy. What's up? Back from the dead. Super pacer. Look at get. Look at my feet. There's tan line. I was, you know, I was happy. It left a lot to be desired, though. I left a lot out there, sort of unfinished business. And I think I would just love to nail this race in a way that really reflects my ability and. Um, the same can be said with the Vermont 50. I, I still still have yet to figure that out, but I think that doing this race and dealing with cramps, which hopefully I can get under control next time, but keep working on the fitness. If I graded my 
my training, probably a B. If I graded this race, it's probably a B. You know, what you what you put into it is sort of what you what you get out. But then there was also that uncertainty of of race execution. And while I didn't really execute perfectly, I don't. You know, I lost my competitive edge, but I only have so much fitness in me to give on a given day. So I think you know that race I could have I could have been around eighteen, maybe eighteen thirty. You know, if I had really been in it mentally but there's a ton of things i did right you know like i feel like my attitude was awesome i wasn't that mean to my my crew or my pacers they might tell you otherwise but no i was pretty pretty nice and and very appreciative to have help out there because doing it solo it's just that makes for a super long day and to have their help was um was really awesome so the heat management i dealt with that really well i got these ten dollar arm sleeves i'll link below those are well worth it putting ice in those and they're really comfortable and made my own ice bandana with a chamois cloth link below that was really nice you know for not being a terribly hot day that helped me out a lot just because I, I can't deal with the heat that well it really stresses me out and with the heat and the effort makes nutrition very difficult too so i drank a lot of my cal i drank probably half my calories and then i did a bunch of shot blocks and goos and the, the, the gels i took the gels were um, you know, vanilla, very basic and try not to upset my stomach. And then anything at the aid table, nothing looked good. Like watermelon was it. And I was just really stressed out. Never felt sick toward until the end when I just had some definitely burped a little bit and could tell that I was a little upset stomach, but ultimately really happy with how the nutrition went. I should do a whole nother video on this nutrition thing. Maybe down the road. My feet were solid. I was wearing the Hoka uh, Challenger ATR fours. Really good shoe. Perfect for this course. Had the right amount of traction. They're pretty lightweight. Very comfortable. Like my toes are good. I put on Unpetroleum Jelly. Link below. Use that stuff all the time. So to pre prevent any sort of chafing all over the body, anywhere you've got contact, put on it. I used that the entire race and used it at all the crude aid stations. So that was really good. And then I brought the Garmin tracker. It was a lot of fun just to send messages out whenever I got to aid stations. A little redundant with their tracking service, but I thought it, I think it worked out pretty well because it showed my actual course. Then there's the okay stuff from the race. And I would say my fitness, B, B plus, went in um, a little under trained. And I knew, I knew that, but I also learned that bike training, while it's good for cardio, is not running. And mountain running is not specific to this race. So if I could do it again, I would um, try to get more just these back-to-back -back longer days of six hours or six hours or more on the weekends um, of super slow running, 10 minute plus miles. Just get the body really adjusted to the, the time on feet. Because I went biking yesterday and there's zero overlap in the way the muscles are used. Like my legs were tired, but they weren't sore when I biked. So for pacing, probably went out a little hot. And But now I know this pacing strategy of walking a lot of these hills and how you're going to feel later in the race and what you can maybe do to preserve your quads. Maybe a little more shuffling on the downhills uh, and like I said, more walking on the uphills. Doing it again, I would have probably somehow tacked on 10 minutes on the front of just take it easy, take it easy on some of the descents and, and climbs because those 10 minutes could have been helped prolong my legs just a little further into the race. The other okay things is be very specific with your crew, what you want and don't want. Like I didn't tell them, Hey, like maybe give me non-caffeinated gel options or make sure I have this, this, and this, or put ice in my water bottles or empty the trash here. There's just you know, when you're running, there's things that you're thinking in your head that your crew has no way of knowing. So I thought I was going to be socializing a lot more during this race. But what happened was um, I found myself alone for a little bit. But then when I caught up with people, I was in the hurt locker. And the last thing I wanted to do is really talk that much. So I just wanted to conserve energy. And I met a lot of great people this weekend. But ultimately, I'd love to just, you know, distract myself from those first um, first half of the race just by chatting with people and, and then really focus on working with my pacers for that home stretch. And then I guess the negative, the bad, the things that I'm definitely going to improve on for my next ultra would be the time at the aid stations. Just be more efficient. Granted, I wanted to hang out with my crew, 
but I want to be more competitive next race. You know, my race strategy wasn't that great. I think picking a pace and be like, okay, I'm going to run this was, was kind of stupid. I should have just gone more by effort and really just walked some of those first hills, like put on an extra four minutes. That would have helped a lot. Yeah, sleep. Sleep's another one I really want to improve on. It's hard to hard to get good sleep when you put a lot of pressure on yourself. You're anxious. There's so many unknowns. But there was several points during the race where I just wanted to curl up and, and take a nap. And hopefully you can minimize that by getting a little better rest going into it. Going off course, not good. Not good at all. And I was just I think that was kind of a freak accident thing because for the most of the race I was very with it and really paying attention. It just happened that Hillary wasn't there to to help either and I didn't have someone in front of me to kind of guide me as well. Although they can guide you off course too. You should never go off course. And the last thing, cramps. Something that's ongoing. I'm I'm continually trying to figure out the solution. Is it salt based, fitness based? potassium, magnesium, calcium. There's so many things, so many variables, and you got to figure it out. And last year at the Vermont 50, I took muscle milk, which I think uh, was loaded more with the calcium and magnesium uh, before the race and in the morning of, and, and maybe that helped. And my legs skipped the cramp phase and went straight to um, blown out phase. So it's it's not like a fix all, but it will, the cramps just killed my momentum. And if I can somehow eliminate that, then at least I can stay in it competitively. And I know what I'm capable of, even on uh, blown out legs. So that's like a big thing for me. And it's something I'm going to play with. So I'm going to get these, um, they're like, you can get Tums or these, um, calcium magnesium supplements linked below as well. So that's it right now. I'm just going to take it easy for a couple weeks and recover. Uh, the biggest thing, my legs are, all the muscle stuff, not a big deal. That's all within a few days has already come back pretty well. I feel good. Um, but the tendons, this, the ankle tendonitis that I've been dealing with, that's not happy. And my left leg has a little bit of Achilles tendonitis. I can feel that creaking. So that's just something I'm going to take care of in the next couple of weeks and, and throughout the rest of the summer. The last thing I want is this to become a chronic thing. And I definitely want to get back out there and do more races. Um, you know, there's a lot of, lot of fun events I haven't done yet. And I would honestly love to come back to the Vermont 100 and, and give it another shot, you know, with everything that I've learned, come in a little more fit and then, uh, really just have another great experience, but hopefully, um, shave off a significant amount of time or places, you know, just ultimately have a good race. So that's it. Thanks for following along. It's been really cool documenting it. Not easy. Takes a lot of time and some thought and hopefully uh, you've learned a little bit along the process.